The Allen Lund Company appreciates all of the dedicated carriers it takes to move loads across the U.S. Stay safe. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. Many things connect trucking to the military. Among the most obvious is the number of veterans in the industry. Many people have honored those veterans in different ways, but one of the most prominent is the Transition Trucking Driving for Excellence Award. This past year, the winner was Brandon Meredith. I'll speak with him about his life, his military experience, and his post-military career. To take part in Mission Military Appreciation, just go to OOIDA.com and click on Become a Member. Also on today's program, the Ohio Turnpike is setting up a cashless system, although for some customers, toll booths will remain in place. I'll talk with Chuck Cyril of the Ohio Turnpike Commission. And finally, road check takes place this week. However, it's not the only safety blitz scheduled this year. Operation Safe Driver is set for later. To get an idea of what you can expect then, I'll talk with Jake Eliverda, CVSA's Director of Enforcement Programs. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. We begin tonight with a new effort to halt the Environmental Protection Agency's new truck emission standards. The state attorneys general of 24 states filing a petition in a federal appellate court on Monday, challenging the EPA's new truck emission rules that were finalized in March. The coalition is being led by Nebraska Attorney General Mike Hilgers. The states plan to argue that the EPA does not have the authority to issue such wide-ranging standards, calling them arbitrary, capricious, an abuse of discretion, and not in accordance with law. EPA's new truck emission standards will require that a quarter of new sleeper cab tractors be zero tailpipe emission trucks by 2032. In a news release, Hilger says the expectations, quote, defy reality. The war against the EPA's rules are now being waged on at least two fronts. Earlier this month, Republican lawmakers in both chambers of Congress introduced a resolution to undo the final rule. Meanwhile, a handful of states are also going after California's strict emission rules, 16 states to be exact, plus the Arizona State Legislature, filing suit in a U.S. federal court over the Advanced Clean Fleets rule, which would ban new fossil fuel-powered heavy-duty truck sales in the state by 2035. The lawsuit claims that the rule forces truckers inside and outside of California to retire their internal combustion trucks if they want to come to California. The suit says that will end up disrupting the supply chain, slowing interstate transportation, raising prices on goods across the country, and imposing costs on taxpayers and governments around the country. The states argue the California rule also violates the Clean Air Act, the Federal Aviation Administration Authorization Act of 1994, and the Constitution's Commerce Clause, which prevents states from imposing protectionist measures that interfere with interstate commerce. The price of diesel continues sliding downward. Last week's national average came in at 384 a gallon, down more than four and a half cents compared to a week earlier. That's according to the Energy Information Administration's latest weekly report. Over the past month, the average for a gallon of diesel has dropped more than 21 cents. Prices down in nine of 10 regions last week. The only exception being the Rocky Mountains, where the average was up six tenths of one cent. Meanwhile, ProMiles.com is telling a similar story this week. The average Tuesday morning was 3.88 a gallon, down more than four cents compared to last Tuesday. Every region on the ProMile survey had prices on the decline. To our nation's capital now, where two identical bills in both chambers of Congress seek to create a new position within the U.S. Department of Transportation. The DOT Victim and Survivor Advocate Act, as it's called, would establish a victim advocate position. The person holding that title would be the point of contact for victims and advocates within the U.S. DOT. They would also consult with the Transportation Secretary on a regular basis and make safety recommendations. The legislation currently has the support of 11 safety organizations. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration plans to maintain its final rule on broker and freight forwarder financial responsibility. Last November, FMCSA published a final rule meant to improve broker security regulations, most notably the suspension of operating authority if available financial security falls below $75,000. Although the owner-operator Independent Drivers Association believes the rule is a step in the right direction, it argues that the agency should be doing even more. Seeking to strengthen the rule, OIDA filed a 
petition for reconsideration in December. FMCSA, however, recently informed the association that it will stay the course with the final rule, which took effect in January. The agency said OIDA's requests were out of scope for this specific rule, but noted that it is taking steps to address broker issues. International Road Check is underway across North America. The Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance Enforcement Blitz runs for three days through Thursday. Certified law enforcement personnel out in force conducting routine North American Standard Level 1 inspections at way and inspection stations, temporary sites, and mobile patrols. Each year, International Road Check places a special emphasis on a category of violations. This year, CVSA Roadside Inspection Specialist Jeremy Disbro says there are two. So this year actually is going to have two focus areas. One is relating to the driver and the other is relating to the vehicle maintenance portion. Um, So in a nutshell, the driver portion is focusing on drug and alcohol issues, um, specifically in the United States dealing with the drug and alcohol clearinghouse, um, just because that's kind of been something that is causing difficulties for drivers uh, as well as enforcement personnel sometimes. And um, The other one is going to be on the vehicle maintenance side, which is focusing on the braking system, which is specifically the tractor protection valve on the on the truck tractor. For more details about International Road Check and the 37 step inspection procedure so you can get ready, head to CVSA.org. Crews on the scene of the Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore took a big step on Monday. They set off a series of explosives, breaking down the largest remaining span of the collapsed bridge. The controlled demolition will allow the container ship that caused this mess to be refloated and moved out. Then comes restoring traffic through the port, which has been halted since March 26th when the incident occurred. Another robo-taxi company is under investigation over two new crashes. This time it's Amazon's robo-taxi service called Zooks. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says the probe was launched after two Zooks vehicles braked suddenly and were rear-ended by motorcyclists. One incident was in San Francisco, the other in Spring Valley, Nevada. Both crashes occurred during the day and involved Toyota Highlander SUVs with autonomous driving technology. NHTSA said they're focusing on the performance of the company's automated driving system during the crashes, as well as its behavior in crosswalks around pedestrians. Zooks was already under investigation by NHTSA, which is looking into whether the autonomous vehicles abide by federal safety standards. OIDA has issued a call to action for its Wisconsin members. It's over SB 613, which Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers recently vetoed. The bill would limit the recovery amounts of non-economic damages from a motor carrier to $1 million. OIDA says the bill would protect small business truckers against nuclear verdicts. The state legislature will try to overturn the governor's veto this week, but they'll need a two-thirds majority to do it. That's why OIDA is asking its Wisconsin members to call their state senator and state assembly representatives and urge them to get on board. And finally, the Port of Wilmington is expanding. Delaware and the port's operator announcing plans to build a second terminal in Edgemoor. When complete, the expansion is expected to quadruple capacity at the port, which will go by the name Port Delaware. It'll also be able to handle larger vessels. The project will cost an estimated $635 million. Construction is slated to take about three years. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. Congratulations to Gabriel Michael of Hayden, Colorado. He's received the OOIDA Safe Driving Award for 24 years of safe, accident-free driving. That's the equivalent of a car driver going 180 years without causing a single accident. The OOIDA Safe Driving Award program is sponsored by Shell Rotella. Marty Ellis and OOIDA's tour truck, the spirit of the American trucker, are at the TA Truck Stop in Seville, Ohio. That's located at exit 209 off Interstate 71 and 76. Stop in, say hi to Marty, and join OOIDA for a $10 discount. Next, I'll talk with military veteran and truck driver Brandon Meredith. We'll be back in just a moment with more of the program. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Capital Reman is your leading source for quality remanufactured engines and components. Capital Reman stands ready to serve all OOIDA members to help reduce costly engine repairs or replacement. Visit CapitalReman.com today and use code OOIDA10 to save. 
Get the most power performance out of your rig with Howe's Diesel Defender. It provides maximum lubricity and contains specialized IDX4 detergent to clean and prevent deposits and safely removes harmful water. Visit HowesProducts.com for more information. Attention professional drivers, do you owe money to the IRS? Integrity Tax Relief Group frees drivers from IRS trouble. Call for help now, 855-976-4291. That's 855-976-4291. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now, welcome back. Many things connect trucking to the military, and among the most obvious is the number of veterans who work in the industry. Many people have honored veterans in the industry in different ways, but one of the most prominent is the Transition Trucking Driving for Excellence Award. Each year, the award honors the top rookie driver who is a veteran, and this past year, that trucker was Brandon Meredith. I spoke with him recently about his life, his military experience, and his post-military career in trucking. I grew up in uh, Illinois, in the Midwest. I mean, I've been working all my life since I was early teens, fast food, steel factories. And, you know, I told the story before that um, my first real job, W-2 job, I guess you would say, was uh, at a truck stop fueling semi-trucks off of Interstate 80 at Fat Brothers in uh, Peru, Illinois. Meredith says both the military and trucking were on his mind early on, that he was always looking for something to broaden his horizons, and that the military offered a chance for some adventure. I was a little bit older than most um, new recruits. I was 23 years old, sat down with the Army recruiter. and He was a uh, an infantry sniper, badass kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I kind of followed in his footsteps, you know, I, 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 it intrigued me quite a bit. So I, I enlisted in the infantry, ended up doing doing some of the same stuff he did, actually. Uh, I went to sniper school and all that, messed around with infantry tanks, and uh, just kind of, you know, went full force into the infantry thing. You know, after a few years of being enlisted, I was selected to be an Army recruiter. wasn't really something I, I wanted to do at the time. Um, you don't really, unless you volunteer for it, you really don't get a choice. Uh, they kind of volun- volunteer you to go uh, <laughs> into something like that. So I ended up going on recruiting duty for a while. And I kind of went back home to the same area I, you know, enlisted from in Illinois and did did my recruiting tour. And once I got, you know, towards the end of that, trying to figure out, you know, hey, where do I want to go from here? Do I want to stay infantry? Or I had some other opportunities, so um, I tried out to uh, do some special operations stuff and kind of just went from there and, you know, spent the last 13 years of my career in, in special ops, being a, a civil, civil affairs operator and being a special operations combat medic. That duty included time overseas in Afghanistan, Africa, and, as Meredith puts it, some places people don't realize we're at. Being in in combat is difficult no matter what, uh, no matter what your mindset is, and being away from your family and your kids. And then there were other trips, you know, where just living off the local economy, you know, as a small footprint or a small team, could have its difficulties as well, or not being able to be comfortable sleeping and, and whatnot. Having ended up with quite a bit of insomnia from it. It was in part a desire for normalcy that eventually led Meredith to leave the service and look for another career. I just felt like it was, um, I had my fun, and you know, I kind of wanted to have somewhat of a more predictable home, family, life, uh, workload, uh, you know, in the military, you're, you're gone even when you're home, whether it be training or whatnot. And it's, you know, it's never planned out to your family's benefit. So, you know, even be, even the position I have now as a truck driver, like there is a little bit more predict predictability in our day-to-day life. And I'm not gone for 
you know, six months at a time, nine months at a time. You know, I may only be gone for a couple of days at a time. It's just something I've always wanted to do. I've always had, had it in the back of my mind. You know, there's a few things that were on my list um, of aspirations to go after. Like I said, one of my first jobs was fueling big rigs. I've always had a, you know, an intrigue with the, with the big rigs and you know, how they operate and how they move everything. Um, my father was a truck driver. You know, I didn't get to live much of that. Uh, but I feel it had something to, you know, do with my aspirations on becoming a truck driver. So I had it planned out for a few years before I retired. I had everything planned out from, you know, when I was going to go to school to when I was going to start applying for jobs and talking to the family about, you know, getting my experience if I had to, you know, be on the road a little bit more at first to get my feet wet or whatnot. I went to a CDL program at a local community college that has a transition program for veterans, but you kind of go to school with everybody that's involved in CDL training. It's not just for military transition members. Um, The reason I picked that school was because they only trained in manual transmission, and I did not want a – they had a good reputation. I didn't want a a restriction on my license uh, coming out. And then, of course, the military paid for it as well, so that, that was a plus. And I didn't have to go to work. I just had to go to CDL school. <laughs> it wasn't just a fascination with life on the road that drew Brandon Meredith to trucking. However, he's actually a third-generation trucker, with his father having worked as an owner-operator for Mercer. However, he didn't get to experience much of his family's history in the business. His father died while trucking. So I don't really have a lot of insight on, you know, what kind of stuff he delved into in the, into the trucking industry. Um, but I know that, you know, he gave his life for it and he did what he loved. So, But it wasn't his family history or even his military experience that brought Brandon to the attention of the people who run the Transition Trucking Award. In fact, until his supervisor called him into her office one day, he had never heard of the award. At first, when he was calling, he thought maybe he had done something wrong. But his terminal manager said the director of his CDL school had nominated him. And his ears perked up when he learned that the prize was a brand new Kenworth. And Brandon wasn't expecting much to come from the nomination. He knew a lot of truckers would be applying for a national award. Well, once we hit the, uh, once we got an email saying we're, you know, in the semifinals and we're going to Ohio for the finalist announcement, uh, you know, it got real at that point. Brandon, of course, won the Transition Trucking Award along with the new truck and transitioned from a company driver into a leased-on owner-operator, and he is just fine with that. I kind of like where I'm at right now, <laughs> obviously. Uh, I got a brand new truck, and it's, it's, it's real nice. Um, I'm, I'm working for a company that I, you know, like working for to begin with, um, so it, that kind of helps. I'm, I'm going to finish up some college uh, I'm not far off from a bachelor's degree. I just, I should already have one. I just kept changing what I wanted to do. Um, so I have about 160 some semester hours and no bachelor's degree. <laughs> so I kind of want to finish that up and, you know, towards the logistics, um, field and see where that takes me. But I, I do like driving right now. Maybe at some point I'll get bored with it. I'm not sure, but maybe going into, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, the management side of the house or becoming an instructor at some point um, kind of tends to be in my wheelhouse. I've, you know, I've always liked instructing and, and teaching and that kind of, that kind of thing in the military. So I have a feeling I might end up doing that in the future. In the meanwhile, he has some advice for his fellow veterans who might be considering a career behind the wheel. Well, I mean, if it's something that they're interested in to begin with, I, you know, some of my first advice would be, you know, go for it. Um, the military is going to pay you or not pay you. The military is going to pay for your training and your certificates and, you know, the ability to get that first step ahead before you even transition out of the military. And then 
you know, there are so many options out there when it comes to driving, whether that be you know, local, over the road, regional, uh, different kinds of freight, um, flatbed, box, uh, doing what I do as a tanker, where, you know, I like what I do because it's, it's not Groundhog Day every day. You know, I'm always going somewhere different. I'm always having to use my brain to unload in certain types of in certain types of ways and environments. You know, you could be an owner operator. You could start your own business. Um, there's, there's, you're not stuck behind a cubicle or anything like that. You know, I think that really fits veterans. Being caged up is really not for us, in my mind. Um, being out and about is good for our mental health. I've been talking with Brandon Meredith, a U.S. Army veteran and the winner of the most recent Transition Trucking Driving for Excellence Award. You can learn more about the program at the website transitiontrucking.org. The Ohio Turnpike recently made a move to bring it closer to what many toll roads across the nation are already doing, instituting a cashless system for those who use the road, avoiding the need to stop at toll booths. The Turnpike is referring to the concept as open road tolling, but in this case, toll booths will not be completely eliminated. Chuck Searle, Communications Director for the Ohio Turnpike and Infrastructure Commission, explains. Open road tolling is obviously known in the uh, toll road industry. It's one of several uh, modes of operation, so to speak. One of the things uh, about our, our new toll collection system it is a combination of open road tolling, which means our customers, which include uh, passengers and uh, commercial truck owners, operators, uh, will be able to travel uh, the 241-mile Ohio Turnpike, which uh, traverses through 13 northern Ohio counties uh, between Pennsylvania and Indiana. They will be able to travel nonstop at highway speeds. Uh, as long as they have easy pass. And to accommodate our customers without easy pass, we're still going to uh, offer them a gated system. That means, you know, again, for our customers that uh, prefer to pull a ticket and pay by cash or credit card, they will be uh, able to continue to do that through, through our gated system. However, not all the current toll gates will remain. The Turnpike Commission said that entry and exit gates have been removed at 20 of the current toll plazas in the state. And the system is not taking the step that some toll roads have of removing toll booths entirely and using license plate readers and other similar technology in order to charge those who do not have a transponder for easy pass or a similar system. The project started several years ago in 2019, and the cost was significant. The first contract that was approved by our commission was completed in 2019, and uh, the cost to complete the five-year project currently runs at about $250 million. However, despite the expense, toll rates will not change overall. EasyPass users will receive a discount, which is typical with the use of such systems, but operational efficiencies that were part of the upgrade saved considerable expense. We've reduced the number of toll plazas from 31 to 24. That will uh, uh, increase uh, operational efficiencies for the Ohio Turnpike and Infrastructure Commission, as well as increased, I'm sorry, not, uh, obviously uh, there will be less stops for our customers at, at toll gates with less toll. But in terms of the actual toll you would pay at one of the remaining gates, has that changed at all? The new uh, toll rate schedule went, uh, went into effect uh, at the end of uh, 2023. Toll rate increases uh, are, are not part of the, the launch of the new system. The new system went into effect in early April and is now operational across the Ohio Turnpike. You can learn more about this and other news items at the website landline.media. For Landline Now, I'm Mark Redding. We'll be back in a moment. Penske owns and operates some of the best maintained vehicles on the planet. Our used trucks come with a five-year maintenance report and pre-sale inspection. So if you're in the market for a top-quality pre-owned truck, look no further. Search our inventory today at PenskeUsedTrucks.com. 
control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2024 when you purchase Loadboard Pro. Landline Now, welcome back. As we mentioned earlier, Road Check takes place this week. However, it's not the only safety blitz scheduled this year. Coming up on July 7th through the 13th is Operation Safe Driver, an event by the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance that focuses not only on commercial vehicles, but also cars and other vehicles that share the road with trucks. To get an idea of what you can expect, I spoke with Jake Eloverda, CVSA's Director of Enforcement Programs. Describe, if you would, what is Operation Safe Driver? So Operation Safe Driver is a safe driving awareness and outreach initiative that the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance does each year. And our focus is aimed at improving driving behaviors of passenger vehicle drivers and commercial motor vehicle drivers uh, through educational outreach, as well as traffic enforcement strategies and interactions to kind of help combat um, the unsafe driving behaviors that we're currently seeing around uh, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. How did the effort start? I mean, what uh, what caused CVSA to try something like this? So actually, it was an offshoot of a grant program that started in the state of Arizona with uh, Arizona DPS and uh, Arizona Trucking Association. And as it started to grow from there, um, CVSA was asked uh, in collaboration with FMCSA whether or not we would be interested in, in uh, assuming the, re- the role of managing uh, Operation Safe Driver, which we have since done. And it's uh, been a very uh, effective campaign for us to just raise the awareness. We know that uh, more than 50% of the crashes that involve a commercial motor vehicle are as a result of uh, unsafe interactions by the passenger vehicle operators. Um, so it's important for us, while it, CVSA deals with commercial vehicle safety, we're really focused on educating those folks that um, aren't in the uh, commercial vehicle safety arena to understand what their actions do and can cause uh, when they uh, are doing these behaviors in and around commercial vehicles and trucks. Now, there are some behaviors that enforcement officers look for every year as part of Operation Safe Driver. And I know you also have uh, uh, some specific categories. I wonder if we can kind of start with the general categories. What are the general behaviors that enforcement officers will be looking for in traffic during this event? So the focus this year is unsafe driving or reckless driving, um, and that typically encompasses, as you indicated, multiple aspects. Um, the previous years, the focus had been with speed, uh, post, uh, well, COVID and post-COVID. Um, the speed of vehicles involved in crashes were up significantly. So we had for uh, several years had been focusing on speed in in and around commercial vehicles. Um, But the other types of violations that we're looking for is uh, the unsafe lane changes, the following too closely, um, failure to use your turn signal, um, traffic, uh, failure to obey traffic uh, devices, whether it's a stop sign or uh, traffic signals. Those are the types of focus the areas that we've been concentrating on. Uh, we've also been looking at distracted driving. The, the use of cell phones is very prolific out there on the highway, um, as well as seatbelt usage. Again, uh, for the most part, seatbelts provide uh, uh, safety for the operator if they do get in the crash, and particularly with the severity of a crash when you take a passenger vehicle and involve it with a commercial motor vehicle, the severity of the injuries can be uh, much higher than that if it was just a passenger vehicle versus a passenger vehicle. You mentioned distracted driving, and of course, we always go to cell phones when we talk about that. 
But there are a lot of different forms of distracted driving. Do they look for these other forms or are there particular ones beyond cell phones that they'll be looking at? Um, it's certainly, it's uh, from an enforcement standpoint, a little more difficult, Mark. I mean, cell phones are very obvious to see that in a person's hand up uh, in front of them or on the side of their uh, head and listening to it. Um, those type of things, that's a very obvious way. Um, but, you know, you're right. There's other distractions. It, be, it can be somebody eating in a vehicle, you know, having a coffee and not being paying attention, spill it on themselves. Um, we've heard the stories about uh, uh, folks putting on makeup. Uh, I know from my prior career, I remember a story hearing a legislator tell me once about watching somebody playing his French horn going down the highway. Uh, those in those kind of what we call cognitive skills, uh, the ability to focus on the main thing and strive it, when you add in those factors, and included in the vehicles, you know, is your music, your interactive devices now that you have, uh, your GPS, uh, you take a look at the big screens now that are on your dashes of your passenger vehicles or even in your trucks, um, those take away from the focus of driving on the highway. So those all can be uh, distractions to that operator. Um, the question is, is whether the officer can actually articulate um, those type of distractions versus the obvious, again, seeing the cell phone in the hand. Uh, you mentioned that the specific focus this year is reckless, careless, or, or dangerous driving. And I'm curious um, why in particular that was chosen for this year. Because I think from, from our membership standpoint, um, it's that's the, what we're seeing um, on the roadway. You know, again, reckless driving, careless driving, the unsafe driving is really taking all those factors. And a lot of times it's multiples of that, yet you have a number of jurisdictions and states that will actually have a specific reckless driving or careless driving that takes in, say, the speed, the following too closely, the improper lane change, failure to turn, use your turn signal, the lights. Um, there are some states will say that if you have like multiple two or three of these violations, then that's uh, your unsafe driving, your reckless driving, your careless driving. And then their enforcement, the, the citation you may receive is enhanced because of those multiple um indicators or multiple violations that encompass that behavior. You know, it's interesting because I remember reading when the pandemic was underway that a lot of these behaviors, the reckless, the careless, the dangerous driving had really, really increased. Do you think that uh, what you're seeing now is maybe just a leftover from that time? Um, I think there's a certain comfort level that some people feel like it's okay to still continue these behaviors. But I will also say that, so in my opinion, you have a certain level of social media that has been able to kind of, um, the videos that are uh, prolific out there and your social media showing these unsafe behaviors. And in some cases, I think some people have accepted as normalized that it's okay to do that and not understanding the consequences or the effects of that behavior. Uh, you take the the Fast and Furious movies, but, you know, some of the behaviors you're seeing out there that uh, the people are drawing attention to themselves and are doing this um, as a specific activity, um, which is really raises concern for us in the highway safety area, just wanting to make sure that the general public, the, the regular motorists are able to get uh, from point A to point B without ever having to have interact with those type of behaviors. Now, I know in addition to enforcement efforts that Operation Safe Driver also includes a kind of information outreach. Um, can you describe that part of Operation Safe Driver and what's involved? Absolutely. So a number of things that CBSA does every year. Um, we have for many years um, produced postcards uh, that are informational that can be handed out. Um, and it, it's not just handed out by enforcement folks. It can be handed out by safety advocates, um, by your DOTs. Um, they're available for the drivers. 
Um, they hand out both the passenger car driver and the commercial driver, the little professional out there. Uh, we make them available the, for the states and jurisdictions to hand out at their rest areas or welcome centers, at their scale houses or port of entries. Um, you have an, uh, some organizations that will order the postcards to give out as part of driver edge class or during some of their driver outreach efforts. Um, carriers will oftentimes order some up to give to their drivers or make them available in, say, the driver lounge or during a safety meeting they may have within their company. Um, so postcards are one of the, the big things that CBSA has done through the years. Uh, we have resources that we have available for Driver's Edge companies. We had updated it about three years ago now um, to allow it where a uh, Driver's Educational instructor could print out the documents in an 8.5 by 11 format for use in Driver's Education. In um, addition, um, we've created media graphics that uh, carriers and uh, enforcement can use on their social media. Uh, one uh, of our industry members suggested, hey, can you create a like a poster graphic that we can print at our facilities, our different facilities around the country um, to highlight the, the program? And we've done that so company can actually print down the graphic for a poster graphic. They can put their company logo on it as well and uh, put it up, whether it's uh, for the public, say it's a rental company or it's a, uh, you know, in your driver's lounge, um, they have that capability. But the, the biggest thing that we've done now for the last uh, three years is worked with um, CBS Community Partnership to produce uh, public service announcements that are, the first year that I dealt with it, did it in 2021, we were, uh, uh, did some, uh, bought some airtime on television, but now we've pretty much gone strictly to a digital format where we can do live stream or stream our PSAs uh, to the, the U.S. in particular. And um, we have both 30 and 15 second PSAs. We've also done a small vignette that's available on our uh, website at cbsa.org and under Operation Safe Driver dot org. And uh, those have been very uh, um, well received. Uh, in a lot of cases, again, the focus is the um, the audience and uh, is focused on educating. Uh, people about in and operate in around vehicles, but our spokes folks, um, the spokesmen and spokeswoman that are on our PSAs for the last couple of years have been the commercial drivers, drivers that are on the road and see the behavior. We've also been fortunate to have industry provide us in cab video that we can incorporate into the PSA so that they see the behaviors of those uh, passenger vehicles operating in and around a commercial vehicle. Um, and so it's been very successful to the point where we can measure how many people have actually seen our videos and PSAs, and we do them both in English and Spanish language now. And uh, we're have, able to see the, the number of people that actually view our videos. And again, it's, um, it's on um, CBS's and Paramount's uh, uh, digital network. So if you ha have uh, access to any of their uh, network systems, you'd see them on that, as well as it also streams on social media and uh, streams on their local channels as well. And we're been fortunate over 13 mil million people will see the messaging that we do every uh, year. I've been talking with Jake Elaverda, CVSA's Director of Enforcement Programs, about the upcoming Operation Safe Driver Enforcement Blitz, which takes place nationwide from July 7th through the 13th. We'll be back in a moment with more of my conversation with Elaverda. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. Firestone tires are for more of everything, with more durability for more miles and more confidence in your fleet. Firestone's tested tires help fleets save with value where it matters most. Learn more at BridgestoneNationalFleet.com slash 4 more miles. 
Today's rising costs affect everyone. Replace your harmonic damper with a genuine Vibratech TVD viscous damper to prevent costly repairs and downtime. Keep your money in your pocket and your truck on the road with Vibratech TVD. Recommended replacement at 500,000 miles or 15,000 hours. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Landline Now, welcome back. Before the break, I was talking with Jake Elaverta, Director of Enforcement Programs at the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, about the upcoming Operation Safe Driver Enforcement Blitz, which takes place nationwide from July 7th through the 13th. We now continue that conversation. I'm curious, Jake, do you have any expectations in terms of the results from this year's event? Um, um, I know that, uh, you know, we report on the results every year, but um, what are your goals this time around? The biggest thing that we look at, and it's a lot like international road check in a way, Mark, is the way to view what are the violations that are being reported to us, um, particularly um, from the for the from the enforcement jurisdictions. So we want to see what are the violations being reported. Now we did change our reporting system last year, so. Uh, one of the challenges that we had was like a little bit of apples and oranges that, uh, re- to compare reporting processes from the, the previous years. Uh, so this year we'll have at least two years in the new system. But it's a way of giving us a baseline of where the activities, and again, it also helps us in addressing where what should be our focus for next, the upcoming Operation Safe Driver Week campaign in 2025. So, you know, you want to see some reductions. I think a lot of times numbers being down um, can be either a good or a bad sign. It's either, you know, the, the public is responding to our messaging or, I mean, is there an issue with uh, the enforcement? I mean, obviously, uh, our enforcement partners, uh, they've had uh, changes since COVID with uh, staffing and being able having to manage their other missions a lot of times, but it, the focus is to really see if we can um, impact change in behavior. And so that's why we look at the reporting information to see, are we having an impact or is there a certain area that we need to focus on more this year than we've done in past years? The other thing we look forward to is Um, being able now to have our associate members, our industry members, be able to report out what they've done for outreach, what kind of uh, best practices we're asking from them. And what are your best practices? How are you working with your drivers or reaching out to the public to educate them about uh, driving in around your commercial vehicles? And this is a, the, this year will be the first opportunity for Operation Safe Driver where um, the industry, our associate members, will also be able to report to us of what they've done for outreach um, and education in, under their operations. Okay. You mentioned road check a couple of times in there, and of course, we've, we've talked about that. Um, I'm kind of curious, um, this is one of several enforcement efforts, Operation Safe Driver. There's also road check. What are the other events or enforcement efforts that CVSA puts on during the course of each year? So for, from a program standpoint, obviously, like I said, we have international road check that happens every year, and that kind of gives us a baseline from of what the industry, what kind of shape the industry is, whether it's their committee, um, their, their vehicles, their drivers, um, their loads. Uh, in addition, we uh, completed this year uh, the Human Trafficking Prevention Program has the Human Trafficking Awareness Initiative. Um, that's a three-month uh, campaign, and that was an educational outreach in January in the U.S., uh, February in Canada, and March in uh, Mexico. And we're getting ready to get those numbers all compiled to report out on that activity. Uh, in addition, we have Operation Airbreak. Uh, we have two events with that. One's an unannounced event 
typically earlier in the year, and then we have an announced event at the, towards the later part of the year. Uh, again, obviously, Operation Safe Driver is the other one. And uh, so those are our, kind of our main efforts that we do. We do have a hazardous materials uh, um, event as well. We do to uh, just measure hazmat safety as well. So uh, those are the focus. And again, some people, uh, I've been questioned before, you know, why do we advertise on a lot of these campaigns when we're going to do it? And at the end of the day, Mark, we're looking for compliance. You know, it's not. It's never been a, 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 the idea of it's a gotcha. We really, in my my career as a law enforcement officer, you know, people would say, "Why does aren't you upset if somebody uh, calls you out and says that hey, you're doing an enforcement detail?" And it's like, no, because at the end of the day, I'm getting compliance. People, if I'm doing a speed enforcement event, and somebody puts it out on the radio or puts it up on Waze app or whatever. That's great because that means that people are going to slow down, and that's what we wanted them to do. So the same thing applies to what we do with International Road Check, Operation Air Break, Operation Safe Driver. This really is to gain compliance, um, and it's an educational opportunity as well. Again, I, I would much rather not have to write tickets if people complied, and and those are the, the you know that's the focus of what we do is really to educate the public on that. Uh, just one other question, Jake, I did want to ask you, and and this is something that we get asked all the time, especially when we do one of these discussions with you or your colleagues at CVSA. We always say and spell it out, it's the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, but inevitably someone asks, and what is that? Um, can you kind of describe for folks that aren't familiar what CVSA is and, and what its mission is? Certainly. So, Commercial Vehicle Alliance, Safety Alliance, CVSA, is we are a nonprofit organization. We're comprised of local, state, provincial, territorial, and federal commercial motor vehicle safety officials, as well as industry representatives. And the alliance's aim is to prevent commercial motor vehicle crashes, injuries, and fatalities. And we believe that in order to do that, it has to be a collaborative effort between government and industry to improve road safety and to save lives. So our membership, we have uh, four classes of membership. Uh, class one is our state provincial agencies that represent the various departments of transportation, public utilities, service commissions, state police, highway patrols, department of motor vehicles, ministries of transport. Our class two members are local members. These are local agencies that are committed within their jurisdictions towards commercial vehicle safety. Our class three members are what we call our associate members, and our associate members are companies, organizations, trade associations, trucking and bus companies, uh, industry suppliers and vendors, training institutions, consultants, insurance companies, state or provincial trucking association and larger and small fleet owners and owner operators. And then our last class is class four, and those are our federal member. Those are members of federal government agency representatives. And so our organization includes over 13,000 uh, enforcement officials. And again, we're just dedicated to transportation safety and committed to uh, achieving the goals of uniformity, the compatibility, and reciprocity of the vehicle inspections that you would see done uh, throughout North America, whether you were stopped in Quebec, Canada, and then you came into the U.S. and were stopped in, say, um, uh, Washington, D.C., or down on Texas on the border and then into Mexico, that the CVSA inspections um, should be consistent across the the Northern Hemisphere. Again, that was Jake Elaverta, Director of Enforcement Programs at the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, talking about the upcoming Operation Safe Driver Enforcement Blitz, which takes place nationwide from July 7th through the 13th. You can learn more about the event or other activities of the CVSA at their website, cvsa.org. Again, that website is cvsa.org. We'll have that website address, along with any other web links, email addresses, or phone numbers we mention on the show, at our website, landlinenow.com. 
just click on the photo or headline at the top of the page. Again, that website is landlinenow.com. That's our program for today. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow with more news and information. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.